So Dedicated to the Oldies came out, did great. Then you had one more album, Always and Forever. Yeah, Always on and Forever. Thump Records. Yeah. How did that one do? They're all good, but what it was is Thump Record wasn't the record label. They were just used as a distribution. So the deal that I had with Thump Record was they put no money off for it. I did all the work, did all the buzz, did all put in the work. They would just put it and so we could get to the stores. Okay. So we just needed an avenue to the stores and they would give us a dollar amount for each record sold. Okay, but you had a problem with Thump Records at one point. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, like I said, I, after I dropped my albums, I started bringing all the homies through. I would kick the homies down with some money. Here's your money. Let me get the thing. Let me put you, put you out there. So I would bring out like a lot of records. I was bringing out like 24 albums a year for constantly. So my check should have been like crazy amount of money. Like I don't want to even say how much money, but they were like huge amounts. But I was getting little hair, little hair, little hair, and I'm hitting up Thump Records like, hey homie, I'm not dumb just off SoundScan because I got the plug into SoundScan. The numbers are like way higher than what you're giving me. So what's going on? Yeah, don't worry. I'm investing in this other business. I'll get this money out, blah, blah, blah. Once I get it, I'll get you the money. Don't worry. It went on for a year. People were like getting in my ears like, you got to shake this spot. You're giving them too much catalog. I mean, I was doing albums on Busy Bone, Lazy Bone, Sugar Free. Okay, this yeah. is while you were on Thump. While I was on Thump, yeah. Okay, and that was going through you? That was going through me, and then I would take it through there for distribution. Uh-huh, okay. So I was bringing them just catalog, homies from the hoods albums that were selling, like, and they couldn't keep up with me. So next thing you know, homies said, get up, fucking figure them out, audit them. They audited them, they owed so much crazy ass money, and that's how I got ownership back of my product, because they owned it. Aha. But then I got okay. my ownership back. So so you sued them? I mean, I didn't sue them. Well, I mean, but uh, an audit. Yeah. yeah, they audited, yeah, they'd say how much money you owe, because I was like, I need to know how much money they owe me. So then they audited them, they said, this was the money. So next thing you know, I come to Bill, I was like, you, you owe me this much money, what's up? He's like, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, let me work it out, let me work it out. So we got to the point where we had to go street with it, and said, look, I'm not gonna take you to court, but if this gets to that level, this is business, and business is gonna get to that level. So we never got to the suing part, because if the suing part, I would've probably got way more money, I would've, you know, but then I would've hired a lawyer that had to go to court. So we, we talked like this, he knew I'm weird with it, because he already know I got money now, I got a guy who did an audit on him, so we can get to that level, Bill, and shit could go all wrong. So then the guys talked to him, we chopped it up, eventually I said, I want all my shit back ownership of all my stuff back okay. or, we're, or it's going to get messy. So instead of him paying you what he owed you, yeah. he gave you your master's back. He gave me my ma He gave me some money too. He gave me, but not, but not the yeah. money he owed you. Yeah, he's not, yeah, <laughs> one fifth or six or I mean, okay. like way down there. But he gave me a little money, got my ownership. So once I got the ownership, I have my own shit to myself now. I mean, someone like yourself with your type of background, when someone's stealing money from you, it's usually handled a certain type of way. Was yeah. there was there a, a temptation to handle it that way? Yeah, but at the end of the day, like you said, like I grew up learning how to politic, right? So by me being locked up, this and that, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna let them know that I'm serious. Yeah. But I'm also gonna talk to them civilized. Right. I'm not gonna go back to jail over. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I could do it if I mean I've been in a situation where fools owe me money and shit got handled because they're coming out like hiding and not playing, they're not playing ball. But when he knew I'm serious, okay. he seen the f shit that's going on, I'm rolling up, like showing him something, but not, not, not fucking coming at him like wrong, but talking nicely, but he okay. sees it, you know, psychologically, right. he's getting the point, you know? Right. So then you leave Thump Records with your whole catalog. Yeah. But you don't start high power yet there is two gangster records, there's East Side Records, and then High Power comes later. Yeah, you're probably just reading some uh, Wikipedia stuff. High Power's been from day one. Okay. It was just, I went through Thump Records. As okay, oh, so that was always yeah. your imprint. Exactly. Okay, yeah. but, but, so, but after Always and Forever, it became High Power? No, it's been High Power. No, since no, no, I mean, yeah. I mean, completely well, independent? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So after that, I went independent, I went to Koch. So Koch uh -huh. was out of New York. Um, so that's strictly for the streets. No, that that one was just a, a project someone did, straight street album, right. different stuff. But it was live in Japan. Yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> live in Chat was the East Side Records. That was some project that we did. Someone gave us paper. We did a project with them. But High Power was always the um, 
label. So as soon as I got out of that, we have people ahead of me that are higher, you know, that help me get out investors that, you know, I talked to. They're like, we got to get you a distribution deal. I ended up getting a deal with Koch Records. It was, it was not even Koch Records, Koch Distribution. Right. So I went through Koch, and now we have a, our own entity at Koch with some guys ahead of me that's okay. kind of involved. In I guess it's E1 now, right? E1 now. It yeah. turned to E1 four years ago, three years ago. So now you have your own label completely independently. Yeah. Well, outside of this whole Thump Records situation. Yeah, independently. So, so which team, means yeah. you still own your own label, your yeah. own masters. Yeah, exactly. Right, so yeah. you don't have that situation yeah. anymore. What, what really changed once you had that situation? You know, the good and the bad, because when I left Thump Records, all the stores were shutting down, like FYE. Yeah. They like shut down three, 400 stores. Virgin, exactly. Tower, so <laughs> everybody. I, I got the fucked up part when I, I, I left them. Now I'm independent, but there's a letter from, e, uh, Koch gets a letter, FYE shutting down 350 stores. So now instead of me seeing those fat, fat checks that I was supposed to be seeing, it's getting fucked. Money's still coming, but the money that I could have seen, I just came in a bad time. And the only reason I got that deal because I was with through Universal. They seen the numbers I was kicking up dust. So every distributor wanted to fuck with me. I put it in and the stores are shutting down. So I'm still making money, but it's not like I could have been like just on some other crazy sky tip, you know? Right. Now, through High Power, a whole bunch of artists started coming through, yeah. right? And these were, so you had named, there was a little flip. Yeah. There was what, Lazy Bone. Lazy Bone, yep. Um, let's keep going. Who else? Busy Bone. Busy uh, Bone. Sugar Free. Sugar Free. MC8. We did something. MC8, with him. right. Yeah, yeah. So we I just did projects with I was messing with the streets. So and, and these were like one offs pretty much? Kind of one off, yeah, because okay. I was in a real record label where I'm yeah. like, I'm gonna have an office. Come on, let's see what we're doing. My thing was like, look, I got some paper, you wanna work, I work the streets. You wanna keep the street buzz popping, you got your shit going already, doing what you're doing. We do a one-off deal, here's some bread, we put it out, you get reaching a different community. Obviously, you already got the community, but there's so many stores, like like you said, I told you Discotheca, Swamis, that your stuff ain't even there. Hmm. And I'm just gonna put it out there and you know get it cracking and blah, blah, blah. To this day, Lazy, he's a good guy. He's always like, man, I, I tripped out of how you see people know about the songs, it's a lot of stuff, and it's straight underground. So I had my own channels of distribution so I still use those angles and still put it in the big stores when I have my own distribution. So it still hit the stores, but I still hit the streets with it. And people were willing to do it. I mean, I had people coming at me like phone calls every day, like, hey, I'm down to do a project like that. Let's work. There's no strings attached. You just drop the music, shoot it to me. I'll do the work on okay. the streets, you know? Yeah, I mean, these are established artists. You're talking about yeah. MCA, you're talking about Lil Flip. These were all major label yeah. artists. And Flip was actually, at that time, when he was really popping. So it was like when Flip got off his major deal, that's when we worked with Flip because I was kicking a lot of dust in Texas and Flip seen that and he's like, yo, I started from independent. That's what his, you know, so I was like, let's work. Yeah. And we just did an album, Little Flip and Capone part one, two and three and just some solo ones from him, right. you know? You know, I've been interviewing Flip for a long time. Really yeah. good dude. Yeah, good guy. Really, yeah. really good dude. Um, I mean, but now you don't really have I mean, I don't really know how it is with the with the discotecas, but, yeah. but the physical stores, even the yeah. mom and pops, are all gone. Yeah, you're right. You know, you're it's right. really you know because I, I talked to a friend of mine who's the head of a a major record label, and he told me that seventy percent of all music these days is being consumed through streaming. Yeah, I'm not. You're right. I mean, I, and seventy percent is now. Is it a little different with with the Spanish community? No, nah, you know what? I mean, yes, a little more. We still hit the streets. We still have the streets, but it's not like the streets that we used to have, like we can't flip 500,000 street rallies, right. you know? Might do a couple thousand here and there, like that's it, you know? Right. So we still have a little extra push than the regular hip hop community, because I know the regular hip hop community, there's nothing. The streets are really yeah, it's dried nothing. up, it's all streaming. Yeah. So we got that little notch that we still got the streets, but it's not crazy, and it still boils down to streaming, like you said, YouTube views, all this stuff that's going on, and literally like in the last two years, I just fresh up on game on that. Like, I didn't even know that. I'm still hitting right, the so streets. It sneaks up on you. Yeah, so I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? This fool don't want to take my CDs? What's going on? Like, I'm thinking they're 
just hating or some shit going down. So I'm going like, yo, I can't sell CDs no more. Yeah. So I'm like, what the fuck? And then or or DVDs for that matter. Exactly. We used <laughs> to drop DVDs. Yep. And now it's like they're no good no more. Irrelevant. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I actually started out, Vlad TV started out as a DVD, as okay, a street yeah. DVD. It was called Hot in Here DVD. Okay, yeah. You know, which is the name of my company. And, um, you know, I saw in 2008, I kept seeing the decline, you know, because I started out yeah. as a mixtape DJ. You know, it's kind oh, of a yeah. similar type of hustle. I started yeah. as a mixtape DJ selling CDs to mom and pops. Yeah. And I started to notice that every month I'd have to put out more CDs I'd have to put out more CDs to try to make what I made last month. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then, yeah. you know, I went to DVDs, and then it started to go the same way. And I started to realize this is all going away. Exactly. And this YouTube shit is the future. Let me move my entire operation You're to the internet than me. in 2008. You're smarter than me. I was still Back in 2008, you were still slanging CDs. I, I mean, I was still pushing CDs. Yeah. I would print up 50,000 copies of a CD for the streets. Yeah. And literally, I'd be like stuck with like... 20,000 or 30,000 right. and I kept going like even the last couple of years I would still go with heavy amounts yeah until I started realizing what the fuck am I just getting a bunch of storage now like I literally got 50,000 plus CD in storage now because of like extra print extra print so I fucked up not thinking I think there's still hope I'm living the old school like it's still the streets but <laughs> streets have changed streets dried up the streets have changed man <laughs>